Lord of the Rings is getting the Star Wars treatment. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special video here today. Because this guy looks like kind of Grayson. I don't know why. It just reminded me of Grayson. We're not going to be doing the typical general fantasy news, mm -hmm. but instead hyper-focusing on one specific fantasy news the story hair, yeah. that dropped this week. I briefly touched Dread on this Gladiator. in the last episode of Fantasy News that was hosted by Murphy Napier mm -hmm. in a cut-in at the beginning, but I want to give my full thoughts on the current state of the Lord of the Rings IP and why my feelings on the headlines we have seen in just the last week are so negative, which is a bit atypical for me to do here. I yeah, I haven't really talked about this at all, but there has been a lot of news and talk about them making more Lord of the Rings stuff, like remaking the movies, etc. Really try and find these silver linings or possible best case scenarios for all kinds of stories here mm -hmm. because I know fans tend to get excited. But when I hear that people are planning to give Lord of the Rings the Star Wars treatment, it makes me basically just nauseous. That might seem over... Do you want to know the truth? I don't care. Because we got the Peter Jackson trilogy, and it doesn't matter how many stupid variations they do after that, it will not take away from the fact that those movies were amazing. And it's like, listen, you go to DeviantArt, and you're going to see a bunch of different fucking stuff for Sonic the Hedgehog. Well, I mean, Sonic, that doesn't mean Sonic has three dicks in the game, does it? No. So who cares? Yeah, I just treat it as fan fiction dramatic but please keep in mind that this is a series that is incredibly special to me and it is okay for people to get really passionate about the things they oh, deeply yeah. care about people are pissed and about yes this. this could absolutely in some miraculous chance result in a ton of great lord of the rings adaptations but is that a hundred percent guys yeah that's totally what's going to happen because that's what's happened to star wars too really likely the number one thing i have seen to be fair i thought rogue one was pretty good and there were some elements of star wars that were good like kylo ren i thought was a good character overall but in general yeah it's an l mandal yeah mandalorian yeah so it's like you just if it's getting the star wars treatment we will probably get a handful of w's but the majority of them will be l's this when people are talking about hey actually be positive i didn't this watch be good is the idea that yes it is just a money-making endeavor but so is all filmmaking in the history of filmmaking so why should you have any different him. expectation here because that is absolutely not true yes making money on the studio level is why movies are made yes. but you need to look no further than the lord of the rings franchise itself to see that passionate filmmakers who really want to get a film made from the ground level up is also a completely valid and interesting part of filmmaking history and one that seems to be completely absent on this soulless corporate buyout of an angle of the Lord of the Rings IP. Mike Flanagan, for the better part of a decade, has been... Well, that's the way they've done with plenty of these things, is they just buy the IP and then they farm it out until nobody likes it anymore actively campaigning to do some kind of adaptation for Dark Tower because he knows, understands, and loves that series and has a specific vision to give something to the fans they will love. And we're going to get into many more angles than just the business well, level. It's the same reason why like Henry Cavill was so good at Geralt, or Geralt of Rivia is because he played the games, right? He liked the, he liked the books, he played the games, and so guess what? The character is going to be good. Later on, including just like the themes of Lord of the Rings and Gerald. the potential of what yeah. kind of adaptation could still be done. But first, let's talk about the fact that this is just Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema buying a sliver of the IP from the Embracer mm -hmm. Group, who has a larger set of the Lord of the Rings rights, and saying they're just going to start giving it the Star Wars treatment. And there's oh, two good. angles to this point that I want to get into. First of which is that I understand there are massive Star Wars fans out there, and yep. I think Star Wars ebbs and flows in qualities. Sometimes you get an Andor, other times you get Rogue One. And there are fans to all of those entries, and that's totally valid. But I cannot stress this enough, especially if you're someone who's not super familiar with these two series on their origin level. Star Wars and Lord of the Rings are entirely consistent. Yeah, my understanding is that both of those were good. Like, I watched Rogue One, I thought Rogue One was great. To be fair, half of the reason why I like the movie is the last two minutes with Darth Vader. But A, it, it was still in the movie, so it counts. 
but uh, I haven't seen Andor. Conceptually different into what makes them interesting and special for fans. Star Wars is kind of this infinite <laughs> sprawling galaxy where, yeah, it yeah, certainly it started with George Lucas, but for decades now, it has a legacy of having creative input from all kinds of minds, expanding the timelines deep in directions that just go far beyond his initial conception of the original trilogy. Fans, This is actually a really good insight that Star Wars has so much more of an extended universe than Lord of the Rings does. Because Lord of the Rings, the Cimmerillion, and like all of the other surrounding work, like The Hobbit, it all was created by Tolkien. It's not like, you know, this other guy, you know, fucking George R. R. Martin did part of it. And then, you know, the guy that did Dune did part of it. And then there are some of these other guys that used to do it and they like retired. So, yeah, I definitely think this is a, this is the case. They're comfortable with that. They are extraordinarily mm -hmm. okay with it. And you can continue to exactly. dump in new characters, ideas. And they've been doing this with Star Wars for years. Like, I'm talking like 20 years they've been adding in, like, oh, this is the Knights of the Old Republic. And these are these other characters and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera factions into the Star Wars universe and they feel like they fit. You of have course. to fuck up pretty gargantuanly within the Star Wars universe to insert something that doesn't feel like it could belong in a planet in some solar system right. somewhere. There's not this really grand thematic cohesion. There's general ideas of good and bad, but yeah, it's not the most complicated or specific series of all time. Lord of the Rings debatably is. Absolutely. This is a story that, yes, has had other authors come in and look at Tolkien's leftover writings and then try and expand or put some cohesive bits together yeah. to put out additional work. But please understand, it is still entirely the creative work of one mind with a specific set of ideas behind it that tell a story with a definitive beginning and end. And the bar for the level of writing that takes place from the Cimmerillion to the Hobbit and the trilogy and the writings after is incredibly high. And so- Yeah, it has very defined lore and the time frame for that lore is also defined. Like everything is defined. All of the characters are defined. The beginning of the universe is defined. I mean, it all is. There are, like, there's a, a few unanswered questions, but I think that they are uh, intentionally unanswered. Like, where did Ungoliant and Tom Bombadil come from? These are, like, just intentionally unanswered questions that Tolkien created for the story. When you see I a think. company come in and say, we're going to give it the Star Wars treatment, the baggage that comes along with that idea yeah. is immense. And in my opinion, antithetical to the foundation of the Lord of the Rings series and why it is important and even influential. You can go watch mm -hmm. the Lord of the Rings breakdown I did here where I get into Tolkien's life and the ideas behind the Lord of the Rings a little bit more specifically. But yep. I want to move on from that literary angle and talk about another that I think is equally as important as to why these specific Star Warsification of Lord of the Rings is just wrong. Now, we don't know exactly... I think this guy actually brings in an insanely good insight, drawing the difference between Star Wars having an extended universe and Lord of the Rings not having an extended universe and not having room for an extended universe. This is an incredibly good insight, and it is a massive difference between Star Wars and Lord of the Rings on the most fundamental of possible levels exactly what they're planning to do in terms of this Star Warsification, but we know they are restricted to the third age, and there seems to be a great amount of hesitation to just cranking out a whole new trilogy of Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King. Nobody's Let's be honest, like though, that. in today's day and age, they would break up each of those books into the two sub-books within them, and would have part six one and part two. Instead, yeah. though, there seems to be this focus on taking individual characters from Lord of the Rings and giving them their own movies, as if Aragorn is somehow a character that can get a treatment like Iron Man. Spoiler alert. Alert. Not at all. I mean, this is something we've started to even seeing happen within Star Wars. Well, the problem is like you have to like there's too much reading between the lines and writing extra lines in between those lines. That's what the issue is. They're like, yeah, of course, it would be interesting to have a book of like, you know, how did Aragorn become Strider? You know, like what led him to being in the Prancing Pony that night whenever uh, Frodo and, and Sam were all there? Absolutely. Like, how did he first meet Gandalf? Like, of course. But it's like, do I trust them to be able to do that properly? And is there enough information to really make a good book or, a good, sorry, a good movie or a series about that? 
Probably not. Two very mixed results. And again, Star Wars characters are not as specifically tailored and designed for the one story they're involved with as Lord of the Rings characters. Mm -hmm. Aragorn, in my subjective opinion, as a character, you get 100% of everything you could possibly need from him from the first time he appears in Fellowship to the end of The Return of the King. Because they're. I think it's fair for people to want to have a little bit more of his backstory because it seems like it doesn't really make a lot of sense, like, uh, you know, how he was, like, raised by Elrond and, and then, like, all this other shit, etc. Yeah, definitely people would want to see a little bit more. I think Aragorn is probably the one example that I wouldn't use, but I think for somebody like Frodo, for example, or somebody like, uh, like Bilbo Baggins, between The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, that's pretty much the whole story. There is a start, a fabulous execution of development, and then an incredibly cathartic end. Yeah. And if you go and take a writer who is not Tolkien and just start shoehorning in audience-pleasing mm -hmm. things earlier happening in Aragorn's life than The Hobbit, what are you adding that's actually beneficial to the artistic ideas behind the character? Well, I think that this is a huge mistake this guy's making because he's assuming that the goal of writing the story for Aragorn is to add to the literary value of Lord of the Rings. So you, that's not the goal, okay? Like, this is... Like, absolutely not the goal. Now, if that happens, oh, that's nice, but definitely not the goal. Nothing. And excuse this comment, but as a fan, it makes me extremely nervous in the day and age where we are consistently getting rather boring fantasy adaptations that are not written on a level that I think many of us have come to expect great shows to be, mm -hmm. to hear that something as highly respected as Lord of the Rings and characters as delicately crafted as the Fellowship could be getting a similar just run through that. I will say, however, I think the silver lining for this is that because the characters are so delicately crafted and they're so like they were made by Tolkien with an ideology that he used to create the entire world, that if it's done wrong, Everybody will just immediately discount this as fan fiction, and it will be like it didn't even happen. Straight up. Like, remember the uh, the animated Lord of the Rings movies? Like, uh, the one with, like, Saruman of many colors and all of the old ones. Like, the actual... I, I remember my fucking teacher made us watch this in fifth grade. It was before uh, Fellowship of the Ring came out, and he's like, Guys... This movie is going to be so good. I read The Lord of the Rings. It's going to be awesome. Like, you don't know, but it's going to be great. And he had us watch the animated versions. And then we watched Lord of the Rings. It was like Return of the King or something like that. And then we watched some fucking Scooby-Doo movie. And he had us vote on which one that we liked more. And everybody voted for Scooby-Doo. Even I did. And he was so mad. But the Scooby-Doo movie was way better. The original Lord of the Rings movies were fucking terrible. They were awful. But nobody talks about it anymore because it's just like, who gives a shit? In the end, yeah, yeah they were isn't going to do the thing where it destroys the legacy of Lord of the Rings or anything that dramatic. They were but cool, it's just a few deeply cool unpleasant to see done to something you really care about. Think yeah. of your favorite book. Now imagine if a writer you specifically didn't like was given the option to take a random character from it and just give them this whole backstory that's going to become a part of the conversation for that character indefinitely afterward. Funny thing. I played Shadowlands. We don't need to get into theoreticals here. I've lived through this. If you want additional proof that this kind of just arbitrary Sylvanas. expanding to random elements, then the Lord of the Rings universe isn't necessarily conducive to modern cinematic storytelling. Uh -huh. You don't need to look any further than the most recent Lord of the Rings adaptation made, Rings of Power, which, yes, has its fans and its over-the-top haters, but overall the consensus seems to be that it was just rather disappointing and particularly boring, especially on the character level. From everything that I saw... I will say um, the Elrond and the dwarf guy. Oh, fuck. How do I forget his name again? Durin. Uh, the Elrond and Durin relationship and that whole arc. I loved it. I thought it was really good. Unironically, I thought it was great. However, 
everything else around that was okay. But it was, I think that this is kind of what he's saying, is it was non-memorable fantasy. Like, nobody's going to go back in 10 years and want to watch Fellowship of the, or sorry, uh, Rings of Power. Like, it, it's like McDonald's content that the moment that you're done with it, it's out of sight, out of mind. Bless you, Kayla. And well, yes, third age is certainly different than second age. It's still a similar practice of taking small nuggets of ideas <laughs> that Tolkien clearly had from his characters and just trying to expand upon them in these grand ways to then try and carry an entire show or movie. That doesn't seem like a very sustainable way to explore Middle Earth in my opinion. Hey, writer's room. So guess what exciting news? We just got the rights to Tolkien's third age. Wow. I know, better than having the second or first, absolutely. But a little bit of a hitch in the road. We can't just retell the Lord of the Rings movies. So instead, I thought it would be fun if you just pick at individual, extremely well-known characters and just start telling some spin-off stories, right? Those are all Just fun. make some no, shit up. you can't violate canon in any way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. And no, developing the character is going to be a little bit of an iffy space as well because they need to align with the character we meet in the books. So well telling, like a Legolas prequel, just make sure he doesn't speak to too many hobbits, because that would really violate his character with the fact that he doesn't speak to Frodo much in the movies. No, I, I haven't read the book. I'm an executive. That, how dare you? Anyway, <laughs> don't worry. Everything's fine. Now I'm going to get back to work talking to today's sponsor, Wraithmark. Bryce said I could get mean for this. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's good. And my bow. Yeah, he said and my bow. No, you're right. And you think about it as a writer... Like, what writer would want to take this on? What writer would want to take on developing a backstory for Legolas, Gandalf, like Aragorn, whenever they know that, you know, there are a hundred degrees in storytelling, and the degree that you can tell this story in is between, you know, like 63.1 and 63.4. If you go outside of that, you're wrong. Nobody would want to do that one so if you don't listen i'm gonna punch you right in the cuticle because this video is brought to you by wraithmark creatives brand new kickstarter for a deluxe edition of sufficiently advanced magic that's right do you remember way back in the day when you i'm gonna be honest i read that as scientifically advanced magic like oh my god you all hounded me incessantly Fuck. to read this book, and I said, yeah, it's pretty good. And for those of you who don't know of this book, the it's first an indie book that actually managed to get its way on the New York Times bestseller list. And while it's not that impressive anymore for a trad published book to get on the New York Times bestseller list, it's incredibly impressive for an indie published book. But there's a reason I've chosen Wraithmark Creative to do my own deluxe editions, because with this bad boy, you're going to be getting a two-piece cover with unique art on the front and back of the book, a leather spine with, of course, that gold stamped foil and a gold the building book on the I have has and an attached ribbon bookmark, high quality offset printing and a custom interior design with embellished chapter headings. That means you can get it all touchy on it. Full color in sheets and at least 10 unique interior art pieces. That's cool. Because, you know, more of you that back it, the more art they get to put on in there. And of course, this provides a great opportunity to grab any previous deluxe editions that Wraithmark has worked. That's crazy. There's so much support for that. I didn't even know this existed. Like this whole community. That's nuts. $70,000 for that. Wow. On, including the Sword of Kaigen, which was a banger hit for That's them. That's crazy. So if you're interested at all, check out the link down below and back the Kickstarter so you learned today. Glintstone back spells IRL. Angry rant. Now, there was one counter argument to this that I came across that did initially actually give me some excitement and put me on board with some of the people who are saying this could possibly be good and let's just be excited. And that's that apparently Peter Jackson, to some extent, is going to be involved with the development of this continued exploration of the Middle Earth. And P I think that they need to have somebody else do it personally. I mean, The Hobbit wasn't really that good. I think that we need to have somebody else do it. Uh, I mean, that that's really, that, that that's my opinion. I think that, yeah, The Lord of the Rings was great, but we can't just only have Peter Jackson doing it. I mean, there's got, there's other people too. Quentin, T <laughs> Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> oh my God. Imagine that. 
The Hobbit was good. I think that The Hobbit was... And, and to be fair, I, I think that... I, I, I don't know. I, I, guess, I guess having Peter Jackson is... My point is, like, it's not that it's a bad thing. It's that it doesn't completely alleviate my concerns. I'm not like, oh, okay, well, he's going to be there. It's going to be good. Peter Jackson, I mean, yeah, he's had a bit of a rocky career as a director, not knocking out of the park every single time. But when it comes to his love of Middle Earth, there are few people who are going to be as respected as him, especially sure. since he has been open and honest about his regrets with the Hobbit trilogy. If he was still trying to defend those, I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... He was winging it and making it up as I went along. Uh, you know, I mean, look, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Okay, you know what? Actually, I, I changed my mind. He's going to be fine. Yep, it's going to be totally okay, guys. I would be like, come on, man. Okay, maybe I don't want you yeah, this to be fine. involved if you can't admit mistakes were made. But he seems to be very vocal that he was screwed over by the studio. There's all kinds of stuff he'd want to change. And that, yeah, okay, he seems to be someone that I still do believe understands Middle Earth. Except he doesn't seem to be getting involved out of some just need creatively to add something into Middle Earth, similar to his initial incredibly long pre and post production and delving into the original Middle Earth trilogy. Yeah, this is kind of the same way I felt about like George R. R. Martin. Martin and uh, how much he was involved with Elden Ring. It's like, or they just put his name on it to make it look good. But then because there was so much incest, I actually do think that he had a lot to do with Elden Ring. But it's even stated here, he's more specifically deciding to get involved because he was frustrated with how many people were assuming he was involved with Rings of Power. To be perfectly fair, I am reading that as negatively as one could, but mm -hmm. if you've seen recent interviews with Jackson, he does seem to be kind of just on this frustration kick recently, and it doesn't seem like the healthiest mentality to be jumping back into Middle Earth, in my impression of recent talks. I've I have no now. idea. I love Peter Jackson as much as the next Lord of the Rings fan, but I don't think frustration Frustration is the best motivation to get involved with a several years long project to go ahead and continue adapting Lord of the Rings. Probably so this kind of gets me into the specific wording it's around fair. the Star Warsification and how I think this is actually something they have said and is extremely poignant in a way that may not be intended. Because I actually think they have the potential to Star Warsify Lord of the Rings in a terrible way. Because oh, yeah. let's think about when Star Wars was initially oh, released. Yeah. That trilogy did something very similar in my mind to the actual initial book release of Lord of the Rings or even the Middle Earth trilogy that Peter Jackson put out. As I said before, those were groundbreaking for their time. Some people argue Tolkien invented epic fantasy with a publication. Peter Jackson's true. There are a lot of things from Dungeons and a lot of the things that we just kind of assume in fantasy are derivative from Tolkien. Absolutely trilogy of movies won there was all fantasy of the before and because after it just him. pushed the bounds of what you could do for VFX the raising yep. the bar. And Star Wars, the original trilogy, was a space epic unseen before, especially yeah. without adaptation inspiring it, just George Lucas's rather overt influence. And, and like my dad, I think my parents saw Star Wars in theaters whenever that shit came out. Star Wars was a big deal also because of the amount of tech in it. Like the amount of like CGI and how cool lightsabers were. It's like what Avatar was in 2008, 2009. Like the movie in itself was like such a massive technological like a a advancement that it was incredible fundamentally. There was no CGI in Star Wars. I I'm just saying like special effects. Like I don't think they had real lightsabers for Star Wars, for example. Like whatever you want to call it. And it was special but i don't think many people are going to argue that star wars in terms of always being VFX. something that's okay. pushing yeah. bounds Fine. or revolutionary is special anymore yes there's some really cutting edge vfx but we're in the day and age where if something doesn't have flawless vfx it's it'll bad. inevitably be brought up in yeah. a review that's now the yeah look at all the things with like the post end game like the that weird guy's face it's like looking weird it's like a ghost like doctor strange with the third eye yeah absolutely standard and while star wars still can have quality entries it's undercut by this constant 
push for just more money, more eyes, oh, more yeah. views. And Lord of the Rings, we have already seen step into that territory with Rings of Power to souring results. And yeah, if they're planning to just start cranking out Aragorn origin movies or just redo the main trilogy for some reason, it could have... To be fair, there is a certain type of content brain that leads me to hope that they redo the original trilogy because you know it's going to be garbage. It's going to be absolutely fucking terrible. And I will farm so many YouTube videos about how bad it's going to be. Have a similar result where instead absolutely. of it feeling like a big deal, a special event when we're getting some kind of push for an adaptation for Lord of the Rings, which even if you hate Rings of Power, mm -hmm. it was a big deal when it was being done. But now oh, yeah. I just have this picture in my mind where I have one of those soulless MCU phase five timelines. But instead of Iron Man, it's like the Mary and Bliss that? MCU phase five. Let's see. Uh, I, oh, they're doing Blade? That's crazy. Phase 5. How many phases are there going to be? It's too many phases. Timelines, but instead of Iron Man... It's wait, wait. <laughs> hey. Yo, there's a Captain America called New World Order? Oh my god. People on the internet are not going to like that. And it's like the Merry and Pippin crop harvest followed up by Legolas's adventures with Gimli somewhere. And if you want to make fun of me for wanting that for just something that's as simple as a book series, I get it. I am absolutely being an over-the-top nerd who is passionate about something. Mm -hmm. But I think that's why half a million people nearly have subscribed here on the channel. Well, there's a, what, who do you think went to watch Lord of the Rings? Passionate nerds. This is what I don't understand. Is that, why is it? that the existing fan base of literally hundreds of millions of people isn't enough. So instead of going for the hundreds of millions of people of existing fan base, they try to go for a non-existent fan base of these culturally aware, like constantly consuming new fantasy media where every five minutes it's a joke. You know, there's some sort of funny joke that they can put in the trailer. Of course, they have some of that in the old movies, but not even nearly as much. It's okay are they? to have IPs, ideas in literature, authors who really affected you as a person. And mm -hmm. I think it's somewhat natural to feel protective over those stories as fans. It's a part Yeah, somebody mentioned in chat the Lord of the Rings uh, games didn't follow the lore and nobody's complaining. That's because I treat Shadow of Mordor. I, I watched a video of it on YouTube. And it was like the guy made like another one ring and he's like, it's blue. And I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. So this is going in the garbage. I just immediately, it's fan fiction. I'm just like, this is fucking stupid. And I just immediately discard it and I never think about it again. Part of the whole death of the author argument. This is a complex topic in terms of why it gets such strong emotional responses to people. But this brings me to my closing point here. The reason people were excited when the original Lord of the Rings trilogy was made into movies was because it felt like we were going to be getting a visual representation in the truest way possible into Tolkien's imagination. People were spending years of their lives developing the smallest bits of detail for those movies to help immerse us mm -hmm. in what is proven to be one of the most expansive and deep worlds ever thought of. Off of the coattails of that incredible effort that had monstrous success, it seems that those in Hollywood who must keep the money machines printing are hoping to ride that wave of success into higher dollar amounts. Despite the fact that for us as fans, that vision into Tolkien's imagination has already been given to us. And yeah, we already got it. Like the Peter Jackson films were really good. All right, let's go. Yeah, we don't, we, we've already got Lord of the Rings. It was great. And if I, if I feel bad about it, or I, I, you know, I miss watching it. It's like, oh man, remember Lord of the Rings? I just go back and watch it again. It's like, man, it really was that good, huh? Damn. That really was something. I remember this back 20 years ago. It was so good.
anything that comes after the fact is clearly going to be expanding on ideas that do not need yeah, put the that VHS level of expanding in. Yeah. because Tolkien himself did not do it. A man who had a long history of trying to get adaptations done, but also having a high standard of who he worked with mm -hmm. and what he greenlit. And what's infuriating to me is I personally know so many authors who have written incredible books with their brilliant imaginations that also deserve to be shown to us the fans and yeah to but the thing is though is that the executives at warner brothers don't know about those books but lord of the rings was really big so why don't we just do that again that's why we keep getting new spider-mans why do we get 15 spider-mans but we only got one movie of the watchmen because they don't like taking risks that's why wider audiences so who might then find great inspiration from a new look into a new world that has not been brought to the live action or animated mm -hmm. for us before. Robin Hobb has never had a live action adaptation that has lived up to the awesomeness that is the Farseer trilogy. Brent Weeks' Night Angel would be a money printing machine to a fantasy teenage audience. But Didn't that guy have a bunch of Wheel of Time books though? Like, is he really sure that he wants? Does he know what he wants? Because I'm pretty sure he got what he wanted last time. And people didn't like that whole Wheel of Time thing, huh? Yeah. Of course, has never been Ooh. touched because it's not a proven IP to give us just billions of dollars in the box office. Because why would exactly. you make anything that can't promise a billion dollars? There you go. Malazan, Book of the Fallen, has respectable voices within the fantasy community claiming this might be truly a fantasy world larger and more impressive than anything Tolkien made. Never going to be adapted in this way. That's right. We never know what it is. is gonna give you a never going to have an idea. Red Rising, if done well, I genuinely believe could be something that reaches a level of popularity that is on an MCU level. Here's another fucking example. How many Golden Age arc videos are we going to get about Berserk? How many of these fucking things are we going to get? We've had five different fucking variations of Golden Age, but nothing before or after that. And yes, I know that we've had some, like the 2017 Berserk. But not really. Due to its incredibly approachable entry into the world, and then its bombastic explosion into being a sci-fi war epic with characters that anyone and everyone would come to love, and a class system that- Hey yo, I didn't say CGI, I didn't say that, I just said that they could make an anime of it. It would be pretty nice to see the Ganeshka arc as an anime that's actually really good. I would be very happy to see this. Inherently draws people in to be like, oh, I'm a it pink, never which is yes, one of those commercial gimmicks that absolutely people in Hollywood would drool over. But it won't be done anytime soon because it's not proven to bring you a billion dollars. Yeah. So as someone who spends their livelihood reading, digesting, and monitoring these stories, I am just tired of seeing the same IPs get the same treatment and desperately waiting and hoping for someone out there to have the creative desire to push for something that is not yet proven to be a billion dollar printer and fight like tooth and nail while series that have already been given what is widely considered to be a perfect adaptation put it to rest is milked until the nipple bleeds well then that's one way to say it isn't it well how about that drop the mic yeah apparently so i, I absolutely uh, agree with them on this a hundred percent and it's like, I think this is why so many people are moving over to like consuming manga and like anime type content. Because like Chainsaw Man, like that shit was crazy. What the fuck? It was insane. Because people like seeing things that take risks and that move outside of the normal scope of the world that they exist in. I think that a lot of times like fantasy can even exist, people's conception of fantasy exists in a very defined way like i remember whenever we were watching that video about it was was it firewatch or something like that it was the 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 manga that the guy from chainsaw man did before fire punch i think uh that the guy from chainsaw man did before uh chainsaw man 
And at the beginning, it said that there was a kid that can regrow his arms. So the village cuts his arms off over and over to feed themselves and they cannibalize him. And I was so happy to see that because I was like, holy fuck, this expands the world of what fantasy is. Nobody did this before, at least not that I know of. This is fucking insane. And it's actually something that increases the, 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 like the fantasy awareness that people have. You know what I mean? Is it, isn't that a stretch? No, it's not a stretch at all. Because what I'm saying is that people are taking risks and trying out different things that are so weird and crazy that they actually expand the scope of what fantasy is. And that's why I think makes these stories so interesting and so compelling. Because it's not safe. It's absolutely fucking insane. And it's and there are some parts of that insanity that are amazing. So that's what I think. Now that's why stories with adult themes are always the best. Way more in-depth and world building. Uh, anime and manga, the only thing that's still taking risks that feels like? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, there's probably a lot of obvious reasons for that. There's probably less money that goes into developing an anime. Like, I'm sure developing Demon Slayer Season 2 probably costs less than uh, Avengers Endgame, okay? Even though Demon Slayer was massively popular. It's just the ceiling for it is probably lower. I could be wrong about that, but I don't think that I am.